Well, good morning, church family. This is Pastor Mark here with our sermon recap for this past week. And you know, we spent the last two weeks looking at two unique individuals in the book of Philippians who are a real blessing both to the Apostle Paul and to the church at Philippi in Timothy and Epaphroditus. And now we moved into chapter 3. And with that, we begin to look at this idea of what it means to rejoice in Jesus. And the Apostle Paul kind of shifts gears. Uh, he was just recently talking about the blessings of friends in ministry, and now he begins to focus his attention on uh, some more important truths that he wants to help communicate to the church at Philippi so that they'll continue to grow and uh, reach their potential for the cause of Christ. And so when we looked at this, we noted just three simple truths that the Apostle Paul was trying to highlight uh, the first thing that we looked at was that we as individuals need to hear Paul's wisdom. And you know, when you begin to look at uh, chapter 3, it begins with that word finally. And it's not in the sense that Paul was concluding his letter because he continues to write for a good bit after this. Uh, but he was basically saying, as for the rest, as for uh, the rest of things, I want you to hear what I'm about to say to you. And so, I kind of have in my mind a picture of a father sitting down with a young teenager saying, look, I, I think you have an understanding of what life is all about, but I want to impart some wisdom to you. I want to share some wisdom with you so that it will help you, so that you can grow from it. And that's what Paul was wanting to do for the church at Philippi. And I have to be honest with you, those uh, moments in my life where people tried to sit me down and share wisdom with me, uh, didn't always go great. A lot of times I didn't want to hear what they had to say. I didn't want to uh, listen because I thought I knew better. But in reality, Paul had walked through a, a great deal in his own life and he wanted to impart some much needed wisdom to the church at Philippi so that they could reach their potential for the cause of Christ. And so as we went through this, those were kind of the things that we highlighted in this thought of hearing Paul's wisdom uh, a couple of quotes that I wanted to share with you, of course, is the one, the one by Charles Spurgeon. He said, As much as to say, if this were the last sentence that I should write to you, I would say, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. It's your privilege, it's your duty to rejoice in God, not in your health, not in your wealth, your children, your prosperity, but in the Lord. There is the unchanging and unbounded source of joy. It will do you no harm to rejoice in the Lord. The more you rejoice in Him, the more spiritually minded will you become. Finally, my brethren, that is, even to the end, not with you the bitter end, but even to the end of life, rejoice in the Lord. It's incumbent upon us as Christians to rise out of our despondencies. Joy should be the normal state of the Christian. What a happy religion is ours in which it is a duty to be happy. That's a great quote to help us understand the need for us to find our joy in Jesus. Our joy is not to be found in our wealth or our health, prosperity, the things that we possess, but rather in a personal and intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And then as I was studying, the Lord kind of shared, uh, kind of laid this uh, thought on my mind. I said that when our joy is rooted in Jesus, it restricts or barricades the avenues that the devil can venture down in an effort to rob us of our joy. And so when our joy is centered and rooted in Jesus Christ, um, it restricts or barricades the avenues of our life that the devil can walk down in an effort to rob us of our joy, in an effort to push those buttons to get our focus and our attention off Christ. So uh, if we dwell on our sorrows, we'll soon become depressed. And if we feed our depression, it will cause us uh, to look at life in a soured sense and it will render us useless in the hands of God. And so it's vitally important for us first to hear uh, Paul's wisdom. And then we looked at heeding Paul's warning. Paul begins to give a warning to the church at Philippi, and he starts out basically by saying, it's not grievous for me to write these same things to you again. Uh, you may think it is. You may think it's a great deal of repetition, but... The truth is, when it comes to learning, we learn through repetition. We learned our ABCs and our 123s, and we learned how to put sentences together uh, to read and write and all that kind of good stuff by repeating those tasks. And uh, it's the same in our walk with Christ. We learn by repetition. And so Paul was saying, look, 
It may seem a little bit repetitive for me to write the same things to you, but you really need to hear this, and it's the same in our life today. We need to hear things over and over and over again. I know growing up, my mom and dad would often make the statement, how many times am I going to have to tell you? And I, even as a parent today, make those same statements to my kids. And it seems like we need to repeat ourselves quite frequently uh, in an effort to help those that we're trying to encourage and strengthen in the faith for them to grow. And same is true in our personal walk with Christ. Uh, according to Job 33, 14, the Bible says, God speaks once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth not. So God's constantly speaking. The issue is we're not always listening and we're not always perceiving and understanding. Um, and then Paul kind of leads into the focal point of his warning and it focuses on the Judaizers, how they had come alongside and tried to undermine Paul's teaching that salvation was through Christ and Christ alone. They were trying to add, yes, whatever with this, this whole Christ business, but, but you need to be circumcised in order to be saved. And uh, Paul wanted to reaffirm to the church at Philippi that it is in Christ and Christ alone. And so Paul highlighted a couple of traits of these, uh, these dogs that, uh, uh, that he noted in chapter 3, verse 2. First, he pointed out their character. He called them dogs. They bark, they bite, they roam in packs, they uh, tear, and they devour. And we noted that God's people are not dogs, they're sheep. And we ought to act that way. We ought to act like sheep in regards to we ought not be uh, ravenous wolves seeking, walking about, seeking whom we can tear down and uh, rip apart, but rather uh, how we can rely on the shepherd. Uh, then we looked at their conduct. The Bible says, beware of evil workers. Uh, these folks were up to no good. They had no intention of bringing harmony to the body of Christ. Matter of fact, they were all about division. That's what they promoted. That's what their propaganda was. They were vicious and they would stop at nothing to promote their own agenda. And then we looked at their claims. It says, beware of the concision. And that's literally the idea that uh, they were promoting the thought that it's uh, salvation cannot be real unless an individual had been circumcised in terms of the physical act of circumcision. Paul had already preached, though, that once we give our heart and life to Christ, there's a circumcision that takes place in our heart and that salvation is, in fact, through a personal relationship with Christ and nothing else. And so it's easy a lot of times for us to focus on our dissenters but the words of Paul should come flooding back to our memory in helping us to remember that what we need to do is rejoice in Jesus. And then we concluded the message by looking at Paul's wishes to honor them. Uh, if anyone had an opportunity to glory in the flesh, it was the Apostle Paul. He has a resume that uh, really is unchallenged in its content. He could say that uh, he had a great upbringing, he had great education, he was uh, permitted to sit under some tremendous teachers. So if anybody could glory in the flesh, it was Paul. But Paul clearly states to the Philippian church, look, have zero confidence in, uh, in the flesh. And so Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Uh, Paul longed for Christ to be glorified in the Philippian church. And I wrote down in my notes, it's, more than simply possessing the outward appearance, the heart must be changed by the gospel. You see, Paul could not boast in his works. Most people who boast in religion rest in what they've done. Christianity boasts in what Christ has already finished on the cross. And I'll close with this thought. Uh, it's in this, this uh, verse 3 that we noted, cultured flesh is still flesh. Uh, you can take someone and dress them up, put them in a nice fancy suit, but the reality is, uh, just like the Apostle Paul knew, he struggled with his flesh. We struggle with our flesh. It cannot be trusted or turned loose, only yielded and surrendered to Christ. And that's the only hope that we have as we walk through this life. If we put any confidence in the flesh, we'll fail. So I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what uh, lessons the Lord's trying to teach. Uh, but as we walk through this, uh, this passage of Scripture in Philippians chapter 3, I think it's a lesson that we could all learn and grow from in understanding that our true joy, true joy, is found in Jesus. And the only way that we'll be able to rejoice if our joy is in Christ. So remember that and just want you to know how much we love you and we appreciate each one of you. 
And uh, look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday as we meet together. Come at 8, 9.30, or 11. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again on Sunday night for our Sunday night uh, Sunday school or small group. Uh, be a part of that. We uh, just want you to know first and foremost that uh, we love you, but more importantly than that, God loves you. I hope you have a great rest of the day.